Um, hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this uh, webinar on PPP financing in Africa, the key factor of success. This webinar is co-organized by the Finance Forum and the Africa chapter of War, the World Association of PPP Units and PPP Professionals. My name is Oliver Stinsi. I'm partner of Edifice Capital Group, and I'm the coordinator of the WAP Finance Forum. I'm very pleased to co-moderate this webinar together with Prima Tuganda, head of the Africa chapter of WAP. Um, some technical issues that this um, web, the duration of this webinar will be one hour from two to three um, G GMT, and it will be recorded. Um, and therefore it will be posted on uh, and available on WARP uh, YouTube channel and WARP uh, website. So before opening the discussion with our panelists, uh, I will just ask them to quickly present themselves. And afterwards, Prima will make a, a incitating uh, presentation of, of WARP. So one last technical point, it's possible to uh, ask questions. We uh, spare some time uh, save some time to this discussion and question and answer at the end of this webinar. So please use the Q and R uh, uh, in uh, in the bottom of your um, of the screen to ask to ask question. So thank you, um, thank you to all of our uh, to all of you to join us and and special thanks to all of our panelists for. Uh, uh, taking their time to share with with us this um, uh, uh, their their experience. So, before giving giving them the floor, I will just make a very quick in introduction of the issue to be that we we propose to discuss during this um, webinar. Um, in in PPP financing, both the public and the private actors have, uh, of course, some expectation. And uh, the financial aspect of, of PPP financing are too often source of a misunderstanding or wrong ideas between the publics and the private actors, but also between uh, the different publics, uh, public actors and the different uh, private actors. Um, the success, a successful PPP, public-private partnership, is based on the capacity of all of these actors to build a win-win situation and a balanced partnership uh, between all of these participants and especially on, on the question of the risk and the question of uh, the financial point of view. Uh, and to, to have this win-win situation on long term because PPP contracts are uh, most of the time on, on quite long, long term. So to achieve this objective, um, the financial structuring of PPP is, is often complex and on the long term with a multiplicity of actors, the government, the public uh, financial organization like the sovereign fund, but also the private actors, the industrial, the financial actors, the bank, the investors, etc. Uh, the objective of this seminar is therefore to explore the respective expectation of both the public and the private uh, actors especially in the Africa uh, context and to highlight uh, the specific role that the financial uh, advisor plays and the uh, specific role of the PPP, the national PPP unit. So these are the main points we would like to, to, to discuss with our panelists today. Um, I will then ask uh, each of them to make a quick presentation. Um, first, Mario, then, uh, Jensen, Abraham, and Modibi. Please, Marilla, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Olivier, and thank you for the invitation. Um, everybody, hello, everyone. Um, I'm um, the CEO of Stoa, uh, who is a holding investment uh, that has been created back uh, four years ago with 600 million euros to invest. Uh, uh, in emerging markets and towards Africa mainly on sustainable and uh, resilient infrastructure and uh, in projects useful for improving quality of life and quality of condition and life condition of the local population. We took an um, active minority stake in project 
develop in five sectors, uh, infrastructure and energy, uh, with the idea also to provide leverage from one euro invested from ours to provide to elevate uh, 15 uh, euro um, together through additional equity and debt. We rely on, on, on two criteria to invest in project. One is obviously profitability, uh, investing in bankable project, but we don't invest in project that does not have any impact in the <clears throat> sector and in the country of uh, intervention. And that means for us providing access to the service to the, lo to the local population improving the service uh, deliver and making it affordable and also making the service less emissive or polluting for the population. Uh, today we have invested almost 350 million euro out of 600 in 11 projects and the next to close will be in Africa in a, a renewable energy platform in solar and mini hydro. Thanks. Thank you, Marilla. Jensen, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Olivia, for setting the tone of uh, today's conversation. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, my name is Johnson Kilangi, and I'm the CEO of Lean Africa Consultants. Uh, this is a project finance and PPP advisory firm. Uh, we incorporated in the Republic of Kenya, uh, based in Nairobi. And uh, what we try and do is to help uh, the public sector officials to better prepare their projects so that these projects are attractive to the private sector, uh, but also helping the same public sector officials uh, to improve the efficiencies in terms of evaluating proposals uh, from the private sector. Uh, we also work with the private sector in terms of equipping them with the knowledge and skills as to how uh, to evaluate uh, proposals coming from the government and also how they can be able to better prepare uh, uh, proposals that they can possibly uh, negotiate uh, with government. Uh, we also, I also lead uh, the Africa Project Finance Program, uh, which I can proudly say is the most practical and action-based training program uh, that identifies and equips professionals in the African space uh, with the right skills, you know, nuggets uh, to be able to better prepare their projects uh, in the future. We are very convinced that uh, the only way we can be able to successfully deliver projects uh, through the PPP model is to enhance and equip uh, all these officials, both uh, the private sector and also the public sector with the tools of trade uh, so that we can be able to more or less uh, structure projects better and drive these projects uh, successfully. It's definitely a great pleasure uh, to share this platform with my fellow members of the WAP. And I look forward to an interesting discussion today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And Johnson, Abraham, please. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone from all the different parts of the world you're joining in. My name is Abraham Duroshaw. I oversee the investment banking and advisory franchise of ARM Holding. It's one of the biggest non-banking financial institution in Nigeria. And we're also the sponsor of the first successful public-private partnership fund, the Toll Road Infrastructure in West Africa, the Lekki Expressway Toll Road Project. Um, we also, on the back of that, set up a private equity fund called the ARM Harry Fund. Uh, on the back of the success of that project to further invest in infrastructure projects across the African continent. Uh, one of the key successful investments in that private equity fund is the Azura Power Project uh, in Nigeria here. Also, our fund has recently set up uh, a climate uh, specific fund to fund projects that are focused on socially responsible projects and are also sensitive to ESG uh, principles. In addition to that, we have also set up a startup investment fund that focus on investing in early stage uh, companies from across the African continent. 
Uh, we are very passionate about infrastructure financing. Uh, we worked very closely with the subnational and the federal government of Nigeria, uh, helping to structure that first successful PPP project, uh, the toll road infrastructure. And on the basis of that, we continue to identify uh, viable projects across the continent to continue to uh, invest in. And we all know that the infrastructure gap in Africa is significant. Uh, we have been playing a leading role with closing that gap over the last 20 years. Uh, again, I'm very glad to be on this panel and I'm glad that you're all tuning in. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to um, all of you. And our friends, uh, Modi Mamakuru uh, seems to have a, a little uh, technical problem to join us, but we hope that you will join us very, very soon. And in between, I will propose that uh, Prima Atuganda uh, present, uh, uh, Prima, he's the head of uh, WARP Africa uh, chapter, present uh, the World Association of PPP Unit and PPP Professional. Prima, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Olivier, and um, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as I've been introduced, my name is Prima Tugonza, and I am the coordinator of the Africa chapter of WAP. Um, I am also a senior legal counsel at the Africa Legal Support Facility. So this very after this afternoon, I have a very simple job, which is to introduce WAP to many of the people on the call that I, I believe will know a little bit or even a lot about WAP. So uh, the name gives it away. WAP is a global network of PPP units and professionals based in Geneva. It's a global independent NGO that serves the PPP profession by promoting international best practices and helping achieve the UN SDGs. Currently, WAP has a membership of uh, 40 PPP units. It's a very young organization, but already has 40 PPP units all over the world and several hundred individuals. So what do we do at WAP? At WAP, we like to say uh, we have a mantra that we do four things, which is we network, we engage, we inform, and we advocate. When we say we network, we really network through allowing for the sharing of experiences and know-how. And we know that where there is a collection of professionals, then the ultimate result really is networking. As you're all aware, PPP, uh, the PPP sector is very interesting because it has a multiplicity of professionals. So we have um, the technical team, the financial team, the legal team, the environmental team, and um, WAP provides the platform in which all these uh, different professionals can come together and interact. Uh, within WAP, we've seen opportunities provided for, uh, for investors to invest into projects. We've seen um, WAP providing a platform for consulting opportunities as well as job opportunities. And uh, we know that it definitely provides access to project advisors and financials um, as these are all part of the platform. So that is uh, really why we exist and it, it's the cornerstone of what WAP does. We also engage and we engage largely through the multilingual webinar uh, series on PPP topics such as these. And currently we have PPP uh, webinars on PPPs held in English, in French and in Spanish. Uh, we like to say that we inform through uh, the publication that is done by WAP members. And so this is an advantage we always give to um, our members to be able to publish their work on PPPs. And uh, this is through the WAP quarterly magazine, as well as the PPP Times, which is a fortnightly newspaper produced by WAP. We advocate, of course, through encouraging PPP best practices. And one of the best practices that we have really been advocating for is people first PPP. So that's what we do. We network, we engage, we advocate, and we also um, do a lot of publishing, which is informing. Regarding the structure of WAP, um, we're divided into regional, sectoral, and thematic chapters simply because of the way PPPs are. So the regional chapters are the smaller units of professionals and, uh, and PPP units in different regions that address the issues of that region. So for example, I had the Africa chapter and that means that within the Africa chapter, we have WAP members based on the continent or interested in doing work on the continent, meeting separately and discussing issues um, uh, that, that affect the region. We have a North America, Latin America, Europe, um, uh, CIS, and, and, and different regional chapters. 
We also know that because PPP is cut across different sectors, we have sectoral chapters. So we have airports, ports, water, healthcare, and lastly, the thematic chapters are the legal, financial, academic, people first. Uh, once you're a member of WAP, you have access to um, being in different chapters. So you can belong to the Africa, the port, and the legal chapter if you're interested in those three chapters. On a day-to-day, -day, professionals and PPP units engage on a channel called the Slack channel, where they interact and they post the latest in the PPP sector in their different areas of operation. Uh, because of time, I'll stop here and I'll just say to join WAP, simply log on to the WAP website, which is wap.org, WAP uh, follow the prompts and you'll be able to join this rich network of professionals. Thank you very much, um, Olivier, and over to you. Well, the first question uh, we would like to ask to our panelists is, um, we would like to understand what are exactly the, the expectation of all type of actors when they, they <laughs> get into, into a PPP. So I would first uh, would like to, to ask to, to Marido in, in your role of a financial, uh, main financial actors in, uh, in, um, in PPP in Africa, uh, what are your expectations when you, uh, are, 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 as a fun, main financial actor, when you enter into a, a PPP in Africa? Um, thanks, Olivier. I think uh, I will try to be brief and concrete. I think <clears throat> the first thing is to, um, is to um, you know, provide an infrastructure that uh, uh, answer and that cover essential needs for the local population served, meaning that uh, you need to deliver a services which is affordable and accessible to the most population. And to give just an illustration or an example, we are involved in a Shigal project, which is a hydro dam project of 420 megawatt in under construction uh, in Cameroon, uh, which uh, will, uh, I think, serve 30% uh, of uh, the electricity base load uh, of Cameroon uh, when it comes into operation, and uh, which is, um, you know, um, in the merit order um, number third uh, after two hydrodynamics that have been amortized. Uh, already um, in, 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 in terms of delivering electricity at uh, you know very affordable price. And that I think you know very key and essential uh, for us. The second aspect is to address as we are in impact fund and we are aligned with the IFC performance standard is to address the uh, environmental and social issue meaning um, dealing with expropriation, right of way and compensation. Um, I think compensation to the affected people, um, also dealing with biodiversity and restoration uh, and dealing also more and more with um, infrastructure that uh, adapt to climate change, I mean, to flood, to Oregon, to land displacement. So this is, you know, really two critical uh, things. Uh, I think the third one is also to ensure that uh, we reach uh, adequate financial equilibrium in a number of projects, especially in the transportation sector, but also in the water sector or waste. Um, I think it's very difficult to uh, implement projects uh, where you don't dimension um, a, a viability gap funding to support construction contracts in relation to infrastructure assets that usually are amortized over a longer period than the PPP or the concession um, duration. Um, and that suppose that there is assumed public contribution uh, to the project to make it viable. Um, or dedicated uh, taxation uh, or, or revenue um, to, to allow the disbalance. Uh, ultimately, it means that, uh, and it has always been the case since I've been involved in project finance uh, for more than uh, 20, 25 years, is uh, 
uh, always the allocation of this to the party best qualified to support uh, it. And it's a question of affordability. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much, um, Marina. Uh, Abraham, I would ask you the same, the same question on your uh, point of view. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm just going to speak practically about our experience on the projects that uh, we've done here in uh, Nigeria, West Africa. I think for us, because of the nature of the economy and the politics of Africa, and especially when you're dealing with projects where you have to recoup your investments from the public, then it means the authority that is in place has to have a degree of commitment to that project. So in terms of our expectations and some of the things we look out for as regards executing projects in Africa, one for us is uh, political stability, right? Because uh, there has to be an atmosphere for which over the lifetime of that project, it will achieve all the objectives and satisfy all the stakeholders. So you have the public, uh, the users, you have the government, you have the sponsors, you have the investors who are putting in their money and expecting a return and recoup also to recoup their investment. So that political stability is very critical. And secondly, is the rule of law. Uh, you know the structure of public-private partnerships. There are a lot of agreements. And you know I can share all the different agreements we had to uh, sign off on, on the Toro projects that we executed in Nigeria. So if there is no atmosphere for which you can enforce those contracts, it becomes a problem uh, for the project because at the end of the day, remember, it's a project finance structure. It's expected to pay back all the investors with its own cash flow, right? So uh, that sanctity and the ability to enforce uh, contracts is very critical. And thirdly, the commitment of the uh, public government is also important. When we executed the projects we did here in Nigeria, we had uh, the support and the backing and the investment of the state government, that's the Lagos state government. And that was one of the key supports that made that project uh, succeed uh, because they have to deal with the soft issues, they have to face the community, uh, they have to be in front now that uh, the people they are governing will have to make payments for the service that will be provided. So that commitment of the government is critical because there's a limit to which you as a private participant can go to enforce uh, your, your, the contracts and your commitment and the expectation uh, that, you, that you require from all the stakeholders. And then lastly, um, appropriate um, distribution of risk and reward is very important. I remember an investor as much as yes, uh, the opportunity to serve the public and provide infrastructure is quite interesting, but an investor is largely in it for a return. So there has to be an appropriate distribution and mix of contribution and the risk and reward, both from the public part, uh, both, both on the private partners, from the financier point of view, and even for all the stakeholders. And lastly, guarantees. Uh, before we executed that project, we had a lot of guarantees to provide security to all the stakeholders uh, to make sure uh, contractual terms will be kept to, you know, such that uh, whether you're an investor, whether you're a government, whether you're a user, across board, all the stakeholders, their interests are well protected. And those were the foundation that made uh, the project uh, successful. So from our experience, those are the key factors that we would like to consider whenever we want to engage on a PPP project, in addition to uh, what my colleague has said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Abraham. I think that um, Mr. Modibu Makalu joined us um, from Bamako. Uh, Modibu, um, 
if you could please, uh, uh, so thank you very much for joining us. And uh, if you could please uh, briefly present yourself and your experience in, uh, in terms of PPP. And we were discussing with our participants um, the different uh, expectation between the public and the private actors uh, were engaged into a PPP contract. So we are the private actors point of view and we, we would like to have the public representative point, point of view as uh, your former role of uh, your role of former uh, head of the PPP national PPP unit of, uh, of money. So Modibur, the floor is yours. Uh, basically, uh, PPP, from my point of view, is uh, is a generic concept uh, because um, depending on who you talk to, it's uh, difficult to have a, a a very clear definitions of PPP. But to my understanding, it's basically an arrangement between uh, uh, private and public entities uh, to undertake a project uh, to design, uh, finance, uh, design, build, operate and maintain public infra infrastructure or services. Uh, but also uh, PPP is a very complex issue depending on the administrative capacity of a country. And you cannot delink uh, public-private infrastructure projects undertakings from the investment climate of the country. And uh, of course, and that includes the administrative capacity. Uh, because if you are in countries like uh, in Nigeria or South Africa, it's uh, much more different than if you are in a country like Mali, where the uh, financials and also the possibilities are uh, much more restricted. But at the same time, we are at a time now in the world where uh, you need more fiscal space because of uh, COVID. Uh, you know, uh, most governments are uh, under stress because of public expendi expenditures and uh, budget deficits. Uh, and now more than ever also, uh, there is a big deficit in, uh, in uh, financing infrastructure, uh, economic and social infrastructure in Africa. Uh, if you take, in, for instance, only power, uh, the 1.4 billion Africans produce as much power as the 82 million Germans. And also, if you take uh, South Africa itself, it's uh, you know two thirds of a cap uh, of a energy capacity is concentrated in in, uh, in South Africa. And South Africa and also North Africa constitute ninety percent of the capacity in Africa. You have so you have about six hundred million Africans that don't have access to energy uh, infrastructure. And the African Development Bank has estimated in uh, twenty nineteen that uh, you need at least yearly between 130 to 170 billions for Africa to catch up. It's, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to catch up uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that it's behind in infrastructure development. And today more than ever, Africa, uh, you know, the, the underlying fact is that, uh, you know, we are not producing, we are not, uh, uh, we are only exporting raw products uh, instead of, uh, you know, uh, making sure that uh, we have industries and that we are exporting those. But to come back to financing uh, PPPs, uh, you need to see how uh, to increase also uh, to increase capital investments. And of course, you need the project preparation and identification. And that's a big issue. And that relates also to the capacity. Uh, administrative capacity because uh, you have to make sure that uh, if there is coherence and also uh, uh, you know credibility uh, within government and political will uh, is the most important because if you cannot reassure private uh, private parties that uh, you know the government is really uh, behind the project and that it will work fully with the private sector, it's gonna be very very uh, difficult. Um, but also uh, the fact of identifying risk, because overall, I am, the most uh, I can understand, I can relate to is that uh, uh, in making sure that uh, we should bear the risk. Once you identify the risk, even including investments, because uh, you know it depends, sometimes government can want to invest, whether it's a joint venture or, or it's a concession, 
it depends who can bear the, the who can bear better the risk. Uh, you have to identify the risk and identify also who can who is uh, the most potent person uh, party that can bear the risk. Uh, and that's uh, also the availability of uh, of uh, capital. And that's uh, another issue. Uh, if you are from my part of the world, you wouldn't have difficulty having uh, private banks uh, investing because they will not. Uh, we are in a regional group, uh, re regional organization that uh, doesn't promote uh, infrastructure development. It's more into trade uh, related uh, um, uh, investments. And uh, these are short terms, uh, maybe maximum two to three years. Whereas for investment, you need a medium term and long term. And that's a, a big issue. So it all depends on, uh, as I said, of your investment framework. What do you want to accomplish? Who are the actors? And uh, are there enough confidence that government and private partners can work efficiently together to make sure that projects are undertaken and follow through? And uh, uh, financial advisors also are very uh, have a keen role in that. Uh, but uh, you have to make sure that uh, you know at least uh, who does what and at what time is well defined. When you have institutional instability, or when uh, the PPP, well, uh, the uh, the framework, uh, the legal framework is not uh, clear, uh, that's uh, a big problem. Hey, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Modibo, for sharing with with us uh, this this point of view and this experience. Uh, there are lots of things in uh, what you what you said, and uh, I think this lead to another. A uh, very key question uh, uh, that will be asked by Prima. Prima Thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Olivier. And um, I'll just quickly jump back to uh, Marie Laurie and Johnson um, in that order. And really, the question is um, based on your experience, what do you consider as the main wrong ideas or misunderstandings about PPPs in Africa? <laughs> So uh, what are the wrong ideas when it comes to financing, when it comes to uh, preparation, when it comes to procurement, um, when it comes to uh, the entire framework uh, of, of and project cycle of PPPs in Africa? Is there is it a question of profitability? Is it a question of uh, the wrong agenda being pushed? Uh, do we is it a question of risk sharing? I know that uh, we've been talking about appropriate risk sharing. Is there a failure between public and private sectors to um, sort of come to the same page or between private actors themselves? Generally, what do you think are, are the wrong ideas or misunderstandings? Over to you, Marie Laurie. Yes, sir. thank you, Prima. Um, I think, first of all, um, I think I've never lost, or uh, we never lost the tender, international tender and the PPP or concession due to IRR or profitability. You know, when, when you evaluate a project, usually, on an NPV basis, what costs the most is the EPC, then the UNM, then the AV maintenance, then the IR, the financial aspect of it, uh, which comes most. So um, that, that is the wrong idea to, to, to dig in into IR and see that uh, this is the one that uh, they are the most uh, in, in evaluation of projects. Uh, clearly, what uh, you know may prevent a concession of PPP to materialize is often the political agenda, because uh, obviously it takes sometimes longer than a pure EPC or performance contract. Uh, despite the fact, uh, you know, I've experienced you know some project where we were awarded a concession uh, years ago. Uh, then they transform into EPC because there was some political agenda, but the EPC is not signed yet and the financing has not been put in place the, because that's the government, as a result, need to find his own, by his own way, uh, you know, the financing to, to support the EPC contract. And that's not uh, obviously that easy. Uh, usually what uh, makes also sometimes project more difficult to conclude is that mobilizing, you know, financing for project of magnitude are outside the usual suspect. I mean, the, the IFI, the DFI, 
uh, might be critical. And there are no projects that are coming up with uh, uh, you know, above 1000 megawatts in hydro or, or even more that we will require to mobilize uh, you, you know, financing outside the usual suspects. And that can include the export credit agency or the Asian finance player. Um, the issue that we deal with also is that the local financing is to, you know, the match the local content or limit the foreign exchange risk is not, uh, you know, sufficiently available, both from a tenuous perspective and volume perspective. Um, so there's been some uh, scheme developed like uh, PRG, uh, and I take the, the, the example of Nashtigal again, to extend tenor from seven to, 15, to 14 to 21 year, which make, you know, um, project more feasible and, and uh, you know, financing more attractive, but that takes very long to, to, to materialize. The foreign exchange uh, is clearly, and the access to foreign currency is typically a, a topic to the ground floor. Uh, not always easy to deal with in the context of foreign exchange or reserve stretch, or also in the reform that um, the CEMAC uh, or, um, or West Africa has experienced um, in, in the two recent years. Uh, to repatriate, um, you know, foreign exchange reserve to 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 the to the central bank, um, that that easily have, have made project more difficult to not to finance, but uh, at least to ensure adequate matching between foreign exchange payment and contract execution, EPC execution, uh, and foreign exchange availability. Uh, during a short-term pe period uh, with the need to repatriate. Um, and, and I think ultimately it's always a matter of how we share the risk and ensure that it's a balance between uh, you know, the party that is uh, that, that should that, that is the best qualified to, to support it. Um, and, you know, usually the discussion are uh, along, you know, risk allocation, contract termination, and caused by force majeure, political will, or by the SPD, and how it is indemnified, who take uh, the risk when, um, when there is, a, you know, inflation escalation or foreign exchange materializing. So, so for me, it's not, you know, they, there is no um, misunderstanding between the parties. It's always a matter of negotiation, uh, balance. It's often, uh, I think, a question of political agenda. Uh, we can have to, to make a project. And, and obviously, I think, uh, you know, the political calendar shall not drive uh, uh, project definition, structuring, negotiation, and execution. Uh, sometimes project takes uh, more than 10 or 15 years to materialize. Sometimes we uh, uh, have, have um, project where profitability study or, or geotechnical study were made, you know, more than, uh, or hydro study were made than 20 years ago. And uh, they are just materialized, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, after a number of, of, of decades, but, um, but, but I think continuity of executive, uh, I think remain for me key for infra project um, in, in, in that respect, um, that, that's clear. Thank you very much, Mary Lori. Um, over to you, Johnson. What, what are the key misunderstandings? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prima. Uh, I think just to uh, to make it clear why I think there are still issues that we need to to, to address in terms in terms of misunderstanding is you have to look at what uh, Africa has been able to achieve for the last two two decades uh, in terms of delivering uh, infrastructure PPP projects successfully. Uh, I still struggle to be convinced that. Uh, uh, the, the kind of progress that we've achieved is commensurate with the kind of investment that governments and other players have put in terms of building uh, the re regulatory framework and also trying to build the capacity in the African space. And I think one of the biggest 
uh, misunderstanding, and I think this is on the side of the public sector officials, uh, is that the PPP model is basically a reserve for the large uh, infrastructure projects, uh, more so the, more, the only, I mean, the economic projects. Uh, I think uh, public sector officials have taken this route without trying to screen and evaluate uh, some of the limitations that the unique challenges that we're facing as Africa uh, pose on the success uh, of PPP projects, especially the large one. So you have a market here that uh, the financial system does not want to lend for long uh, to these projects. You have a market that is perceived to be very risky. Uh, you have not been able to convey a consistent track record in terms of delivering uh, PPP projects successfully. Uh, you have a problem uh, uh, convincing players in the market that you are committed uh, as a government uh, to honor and protect private sector investments. So I think public officials need to analyze uh, all these factors and make a, a, strategic, a strategic decision. Can we still pursue uh, or deliver large projects using the PPP model given all these challenges that we face uh, as a continent. I, I don't think, uh, and I'm, I'm still not convinced that uh, the PPP model will be the most suitable uh, model to procure large projects if we have not addressed uh, some of these issues that uh, I'm addressing. So I think my, my advice would be, uh, we need to take time to evaluate all this. Uh, I think it's recommended that uh, we try and attempt relatively smaller projects uh, that can be able to still be delivered successfully uh, under all these circumstances that we've mentioned. But of course, uh, with a focus on building the right uh, capacity, you know, the right environment uh, in the future so that we can be able to see uh, more and more projects coming through uh, this uh, model. If that is not addressed, then it becomes very difficult to attract private sector financing for projects unless we have other mitigation factors, including uh, bring on board the DFIs, uh, but as we know, that is not sustainable. Uh, COVID-19, of course, has, has, has taught us a lesson. I think there's need for us to uh, re-evaluate and, and make sure that we are attempting the right projects given uh, these limitations in the market. Thank you very much, uh, Johnson. I see that we are running out of time. We have about 15 minutes. Um, Thank you for the questions that are coming through the q and I will just quickly um, ask Modibo uh, to let us know if there's a risk uh, of misunderstanding between the different public actors. And at least I know that as an advisor to the public sector, this is something that I see a lot. So um, do you see a lot of, uh, especially when it comes to financial matters? So for example, when it comes to the Ministry of Finance and the Technical Ministry, what, um, as well as the PPP unit, what sort of misunderstandings uh, do you see between these three um, public entities? Because they all have to, in, in, in order for a PPP to be successful, the public sector as a unit has, has to be on the same page. Uh, Modibo, over to you briefly. You're muted, you're muted. Yes, thank you, Fima. I think uh, the coherence of the investment framework is very, very, very important because we're, as I said, we're talking about uh, medium term to long term concerning investment. But, the, uh, you know, we uh, intend to think that uh, uh, in countries like mine that uh, all projects can be done in PPPs, no. We need to identify the right project. Not all projects can be conducted in PPPs. We need to evaluate and make sure what's the most effective way uh, to achieve value for money for a project, a specific project. So that's why the identification and the selection of a project, because if you have a wishing list, you know, uh, you, you will not be very credible uh, to, to, the, to the investors. issue, but also you have to, like you said, um, between, uh, uh, in, within government itself, PPP is not very well understood. As I said, administrative capacity is very important, but more than that, political will. Because if you have a PPP unit outside of ministry and finance, it might cause also difficulties because uh, uh, sometimes the minister of finance will see you, uh, uh, will not uh, very much collaborate with you. 
uh, and um, also uh, line ministries. Uh, it all depends how your uh, legal framework is set, uh, because the, law, the PPP law, uh, and how also you work with the others. Because now the, that's the, also the importance of the PPP unit. If it is put in place, it needs to work with all actors, especially within government first, and make sure that the political uh, pre pressure is there. And that's why the PPP unit, in my mind, uh, when I was running it, it was in the prime minister's office, but I, you know, I think it needs to be at least at the president's office because you, know, you will run into political difficulties uh, between line ministries and the ministry of finance and uh, various other uh, issues uh, because you know, line ministries uh, uh, usually are in uh, our law in charge of the project, uh, even though ministry of finance has a way of saying how the project will be financed. So you need to really make sure uh, that the framework is very coherent and that uh, and make sure that uh, projects are carefully analyzed and that make sure that there's, at the end, you have value for money for a specific project. Thank you very much, um, Modibo. Olivier, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Prima. Thank you, Modibo. Um, based on uh, all that has been said so far, um, we we identify, we see that there are there are several obstacles and uh, several difficulties on uh, on PPP PPP financing, uh, based on on the length of the contract, of the uh, capacity of the actor, and uh, uh, the specificity of this uh, of, of this type of contract. So. I would like uh, Johnson to to ask you, based on this, what is your point of view of the role of the financial advisor? How could the financial advisor help to solve this this obstacle, these difficulties, and uh, uh, to clarify uh, this misunderstanding between the public and private actors, but also as Modibo and Abraham and Marty said, between the different type of private, uh, private actors. This is the first part of the question. And the second one is, uh, do you see any, any other barriers in terms of financing PPP in, in Africa? Basically, is there enough, enough cash? Is there uh, sometimes uh, people say the, the main point is not, is not the availability of cash, but it's, it's the availability of, of project. Uh, what about the tenor of, uh, of the loan? What about the, uh, the interest rate? How do you see, how do you see this, uh, this as a financial advisor? Uh, thank you very much, Olivia. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible because of the interest of time. I think we cannot underestimate uh, the role of proper preparation of projects, uh, especially those that are going to be procured and financed uh, through the PPP. Uh, I think uh, there also has been a misconception that uh, preparation of these projects is a role that squarely sits on the, on the side of uh, the advisors. Uh, but I think going forward, uh, gone are the days whereby the public sector officials will sit back and lead, let this role be driven uh, by the uh, advisors. So as much as the financial advisor is very centric in terms of preparing uh, the project properly, I think there's need uh, for governments to also build special teams, internal teams that better understand the need. I think that is the most important. So that whatever solution we are coming out uh, with to address those needs uh, is the most optimal, is better prepared, we've sounded the market, we understand that uh, we can confidently use the PPP model to deliver that project. I think that is what I can say in terms of the financial advisor, but then uh, we have a risk and we know this has been happening in the African space. Uh, I think we need to reinforce uh, you know, the framework uh, under which we use to select and screen the advisors that we adopt uh, for projects. I think the advisors uh, uh, need to better understand uh, the space. I think the advisors need to come up with solutions that have been tested and solutions that can be able to address uh, the need. So uh, I think we need to strengthen that, uh, improve uh, the framework as to how we select uh, advisors. And I think going forward, working together with uh, the procuring authority. Uh, and I, I still insist that we need to equip the procuring authority uh, with the tools of trade uh, so that they can be able to critique and, and work together with these advisors to deliver uh, better prepared projects. 
Uh, and I think coming back to your second question in terms of limitations, yes, uh, I think, uh, as I've said before, the African continent faces quite a number of, of, of challenges. Uh, we should not overlook the impact of this uh, situation uh, that we are in uh, on, on, of course, the success uh, of PPP projects. So if you have a government that still believes that the private sector will come and provide all the financing and solve all the problems uh, of the government, I think we are lost. And of course, that becomes very difficult for pl uh, private players to come on board, on board and work with the government. Uh, of course, we have still a risky market, uh, as I've said before. Uh, so we need to adequately compensate uh, the private players that have come on board to finance these projects. So if the government officials do not appreciate that fact, and this is a fact because if that is not addressed, uh, then we, chances are very slim that you'll get the right uh, players from the private sector to come and work uh, with the government. And I think the other issue is the financial market. Uh, I think uh, it is not going to be sustainable uh, to still depend on international sources of financing for projects. Uh, let's not uh, ignore the fact that our currencies uh, are volatile. Uh, and of course, the international providers of finance uh, would definitely need to be uh, compensated for you know, the, the, the forex risk. And that becomes counterproductive. We still want to pursue international sources of financing. So there is need for us to think, and I think this is the billion dollar question, how do we unlock local financing? Uh, let's move from this uh, mere talk in, in our conferences and look at practical solutions on the ground. How can government, for example, start thinking of the needs and requirements of the local players in the financial system and structure projects in a way that will incentivize those players to start participating in these projects. I think that is a starting point, and we need now to have public officials that will be alive uh, to the, some of these practical issues so that we can slowly see uh, uh, local capital flowing into the infra infrastructure space so that in the future years, uh, then we can see more and more uh, participation of uh, local players in this space. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Johnson, um, we only have a couple of minutes left if we, we, we want to, to, to keep uh, one hour, uh, within one hour. I will just ask uh, one last question to, to, to Modibo, if you could make a, a short answer. Uh, you were, uh, you were uh, head of uh, the National PPP uh, Unit of Mali, but you uh, uh, at this uh, function, you were also uh, representative of Mali uh, into the regional uh, PPP unit of uh, WEM, of UMOA, West African Monetary and Economic Union. Um, what is what were what was the role? What is the role of this uh, of this uh, uh, regional PPP unit? And uh, uh, there are of course some specificities and some uh, the the regional level had uh, more difficulties in in the structuring of the project. So uh, what role play this uh, regional PPP unit and, and could you give us uh, very briefly some example of projects that were developed by this regional PPP unit? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Olivier, very shortly. Um, as you said, the uh, West African uh, uh, region of uh, eight countries that have in common, uh, the common currency is Frank CFA, uh, have uh, uh, in fact, uh, a, a PPC, PPP unit, uh, but uh, this was mainly um, uh, instructed by the heads of state in 2012 because they thought that uh, uh, we needed to have undertake regional projects uh, and make sure that we have economies of scale. And also the fact that uh, uh, the eight countries have had common projects, uh, including uh, uh, infrastructure projects uh, and social also projects uh, uh, and socioeconomic project, uh, that it would be easier if the countries went uh, ahead together. But at the same time, there were some difficulties because every country had its uh, PPP law uh, and uh, we had to resolve, as I had said, of the investment framework, the legal framework is very important. Uh, and uh, we then uh, started working on having a common legal framework. Uh, and uh, this was just accomplished now but uh, now it's uh, 
political will is, uh, you know, basically, and also, like I said, the institutional instability, because usually when the governments change, uh, yeah, they change the PPP units, uh, the ministers change, and then uh, you have to start all over. This is the main difficulty we've had in accomplishing uh, projects. But we have some uh, main project, priority projects that are in the pipeline that, that are uh, uh, being uh, looked at now uh, and uh, should be undertaken very shortly. Okay, thank you very much, um, Madibo. Uh, I propose to take a couple of minutes uh, additional on the time to uh, raise some, uh, some, some of the question. Unfortunately, I don't think we will uh, have all the question, but uh, there, is, uh, there is one specific question we will uh, about the role of, of financial. It's Johnson, you, you mentioned that the role of, of local financing and especially the, how this is the role of, uh, of uh, the, the pension fund of, uh, uh, of the African, African, uh, um, African state and how is it possible to, uh, to make this uh, infrastructure instruments more attractive for local local investors that is one of the uh, of the question uh, so there is also no, another question on the legal framework but i think we uh, uh, there is a a, a, a a legal chapter uh, of what that organized specific uh, webinar on on this and it will be much uh, better place to uh, to answer to to this question. There is also a, a question on uh, on the uh, political instability in uh, uh, several countries in uh, in in West Africa. So, if you could um, answer, uh, just give us your point of view on these two or three main issue. Uh, I propose that each of you go um, take take the. Uh, uh, answer to, to this question in uh, very very quickly. May, maybe Maridor, how do you see as a as, as an investor, as a financial actor, uh, the question of political instability? How do you see uh, the cooperation with local uh, uh, financing instrument, especially the uh, the African Pension Fund, please? Okay, uh, I sorry. I think um, political instability. I think. Um, I've been in the market for more than 25 years, so I've seen a uh, you know, period of uh, crisis, uh, political um, swing um, in, in different countries. Um, all in all, infrastructure are usually uh, not uh, affected or less affected or destroyed. Um, because they are uh, key uh, for the economy to continue. As an example, uh, we have set up a platform with uh, CARE, uh, which is an um, um, energy producer um, uh, in, in Africa called uh, Make It Happen in Africa. Uh, and we are 49% ownership of this new platform. And we close our first transaction in Burkina Faso. Uh, just a few days before, um, uh, the, the event uh, that took place, um, we were not destabilized uh, as a result. There has been continuity provided by um, the, the, the new politician in place and, and the military in place since then. Um, we have been able to draw down on our facility and also, also declare notice to proceed with the EPC. Obviously, with some, uh, you, you know, dialogue and checks uh, locally um, to, to ensure that uh, we can execute uh, the construction in uh, good condition. And, but, but obviously, it requires, I think, what we call sans froid, I would say, uh, uh, and, um, time uh, to, to assess the situation in order to, 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 to continue. So, um, you know, I've been in, in emerging and developing Parkhead for quite a long time. And um, what, what is good is that we have a long-term investor that are usually there to uh, provide support to counter cyc cyclical um, situation. 
Um, I think the AFD and the CDC, they are there for that purpose. Um, and, uh, you know, infrastructure are proved very resilient to the pandemic. Um, so I, I think this, you know, I, I'm not, um, I'm not afraid of that. It just require patient time. And I think establishing trust and confidence with uh, uh, the different party we are involved in. Um, and also to prioritize, I think, the, 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 the risk in terms of uh, execution. That's what uh, we are uh, doing in every single assets we have. Um, trying not to be um, um, dis disturbed or uh, by uh, you know very little things that uh, from uh, I think Paris offices or Washington offices uh, can make a lot of noise, but uh, ultimately on ground uh, are not that essential. Okay, thank you very much, Marina. Uh, Abraham, please. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me say that within our own group, we have the second largest pension fund in Nigeria. Uh, the pension industry is beginning to open up uh, to investing in infrastructure finance in Nigeria. And the reason why that I think that pension fund is very critical and which is connected to what Johnson said earlier, you know, the volatility in our currency requires that we begin to find innovative solution locally and even to mobilize resources uh, locally so that local currency financing uh, can match the local currency cash flow from the project. So um, I think what has really restricted the, the pension industry in Nigeria so far is because of regulation. Uh, but one good thing we have as an advantage in Nigeria is, you know, we have a very, very young population. So the, the opportunity to invest for a long term is actually on the table for the pension fund. And we are beginning to see uh, that open up. And also in terms of the opportunities, the, in Nigeria, we're just about to privatize about 12 uh, highways across the country. So in the midst of all the challenges, I'm just trying to highlight that there are opportunities and capital is always looking for an opportunity to make a decent return, of course, with all the risk well mitigated. So yes, it is very, very critical for us to have this project locally. The number of them coming up, I read in the news today, the Nigerian government has said that they are going to privatize all the uh, airports, you know, maybe a joint venture, maybe a concession agreement, uh, all the details will come out uh, later. But are there opportunities? Absolutely. I think the key issue is, which I want to mention is capacity development. And that is why I like a session like this, where all of us are learning, I believe people from government, people from the private sector, and I will encourage people to join the WAPPP so that you have opportunities like this to learn. Uh, whether it's the government, whether it's the private sector, even the investors, even the pension fund managers need to be well-educated about this uh, infrastructure opportunities, the PPP opportunity, uh, what are the risks, what are the rewards, so that we can have a bespoke African solution to mitigate uh, the problems we have and also to close this over $200 billion financing uh, and infrastructure gap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jensen, please. Thank you, Olivia. Um, I think for me, I'll go straight to uh, the big elephant in the room, the government. Uh, I think, in my opinion, government uh, might be the impediment to the flow of local capital into these infrastructure projects. So first of all, let's work out, uh, you know, and, and ensure that we have an ecosystem uh, that will attract uh, local finance into these projects. Let's have a government that is committed, a government that will honor payments uh, in the long term to the private sector. And of course, capacity. Uh, we have to build uh, the requisite capacity to evaluate uh, all these opportunities uh, so that local private sector players can be able to pick good projects uh, that will promise uh, better returns in the market. And, and of course, government has to go an extra mile 
be proactive a bit to understand what is it that these private sector players want. If you're talking about pension uh, funds, what is their liability structure like? And how can we structure our projects to make sure that these cash flows that will be generated by these projects uh, match in a sustainable way, you know, the demands uh, of the pensioners of these funds. So I, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, heavy lifting that needs to be done uh, as, as Abraham has said, you know, to equip uh, decision makers uh, in the public sector and also top decision makers in these pension funds uh, and also commercial banks to understand, you know, the dynamics of these projects. And, and I think the last thing I can say is that uh, governments perhaps uh, just to jumpstart uh, attracting investment from these local players might make might need to make a strategic decision. Perhaps we might need to support uh, these players more so that we see uh, the first or pioneer uh, PPP projects financed by the local players uh, being delivered successfully. We have to go an extra mile so that subsequently it becomes easier for the same government uh, to attract these local uh, financial players. I'm yet to see a government that is proactive as such. Uh, so uh, I think let's work on the government, let's ensure we have the right skills, we have the tools of trade uh, to be able to work out a solution that works for all these players uh, in this space. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Johnson and uh, Modibo. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Olivier. Um, I think it's all about uh, mitigating risk, identifying the risk and mitigating them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as it was said, uh, uh, capacity development is very important, uh, not only for private actors, but also for public actors also. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, capacity development is very important because uh, if you're going to talk mid and long term, uh, you need to have a clear understanding that uh, uh, certain issues need to be taken into uh, account. And uh, also that uh, priorities have to be set. But most of all, uh, the rule of the game has to be clear. If your uh, legal framework is uh, not uh, very well defined, uh, you, you and, uh, I mean, uh, you could go into litigations and um, uh, issues like that. But also uh, one of the issues I found more pertinent uh, to address as far as capacity development is concerned is project finance. And um, in uh, my country, for instance, this is a very well, little known uh, in the public sector uh, because uh, project, uh, project financing is a very specific uh, form of financing. Uh, and uh, uh, government needs to really, and uh, uh, private actors really need to have a clear understanding of how that works and uh, you know how the revenue streams will be uh, uh, defined and also the risk involved in managing the project uh, and also uh, how the, uh, it can be sure that uh, uh, the, uh, the risks are identified and also are borne by the you know, parties that are able to, uh, to, 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 take, uh, in, uh, to take these risks. Because most of the time you would find that in most projects, uh, you know, most of the risk is put into the public sector. And uh, this is uh, not, uh, we need to really make sure that uh, we have value for money for this PPP project. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Maribo. We, we now arrive at the end of, uh, of this webinar. We already take 15, 13, 15 minutes on additional time. Uh, I just would like to ask each of the panelists to um, give us one, one or two top recommendation uh, to ease uh, financing PPP in, uh, in Africa, just in, in a few words, something very, very practical that could be shared with uh, our guests and, and participants, please. Uh, Marie-Laure, may we yeah. begin with you? Yeah, maybe uh, I think, uh... Astoa, we are available also to help, uh, you know, local government uh, to design uh, and define projects. We are currently working with a few of them on specific uh, infrastructure projects, in, uh, especially in the transportation sector. 
uh, but also in the energy sector uh, with the idea to um, define the scope, the expectation and the challenge, I think through very feasibility study uh, involving some technical aspect, environment, sometimes tracks, traffic and bankability uh, with the idea to define the, the landscape and build a robust and uh, viable infrastructure project. I think it's very key to understand each other um, in that, in that uh, aspect, uh, what people expect uh, from and the political will, but also the challenge associated to it. And, and often we try to face projects when we can, uh, so as to ensure that there is a first step that demonstrates concretely a result. Um, then, then move to the another to, to another one. I think that's I think one of the items where we can uh, provide support uh, together with other partners. Another one is also competitive dialogue. Um, I, I think on international tendering process, there need to be a dialogue uh, between the parties. Often, that's not always the case. With uh, I think uh, the IFI that are uh, basically advising the governance. And it's helped defining the technical uh, you know, solution before looking at the cost and financing and uh, the, 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 the commercial offer itself. Um, it's really critical to define the best solution uh, for, uh, for both parties and um, also in, improve um, the, the, the overall uh, contractual scheme. So I, I really encourage um, uh, you know, um, people for, for that competitive dialogue when there is a international tender. And, uh, not, and not only to look at uh, the cost itself, but also on the spec and the technical solution provide long term. Thank you very much, Marla. Um, Modibo, uh, to share yeah. recommendation in a few words, please. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, I think uh, if we are going to have uh, uh, the private sector involved in uh, participation of uh, financing, developing, operating, or uh, maintenance of uh, development project, uh, projects, uh, be, be it uh, uh, social, social or economic uh, infrastructure, we also need uh, to take, undertake the heavy task of also making sure that uh, we define how we uh, regulate how we monitor and also how we supervise these contracts that are mid-term to long-term. And this is one of the most difficult uh, tasks because as you know, uh, you know the, uh, the mid and long-term in Africa is very uh, difficult to define. And uh, we need to really make sure that uh, uh, more of the public policies, uh, especially if we are talking about investment, uh, because one of the issues I have faced is that uh, most of the time, when there are projects, uh, people just under, want to undertake the project. Uh, they want uh, uh, public money to undertake the project, but they don't think about the operations, the maintenance, and all of those issues. Uh, and uh, these are, you know, usually involved uh, for value for money. And uh, so most of the time, it's a political decision. But uh, we need to make sure that it becomes an investment decision of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vadim. Uh, Abraham? Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, in addition to what has been said, uh, firstly, what I will say is the opportunities are bound. That is very fundamental. And our work now is really to roll our sleeves uh, to translate those challenges that, you know, that permit the entire continent and translate these opportunities, right? So the second thing I would say is capacity building is critical. And I can share that from my experience on the project we worked on, because in those days, Nigeria really didn't have uh, regulations around public-private partnerships. And so, our project was more like a, a guinea pig used to mature even the government. And thirdly, be ready for a long journey. Uh, and during that long journey, both all the parties, the investors, the project managers, the government themselves, even the public, will all learn from this. Let's not forget that 
PPP has been around for well over 200 years in some of these development, developed markets. We are just beginning to look at this option for financing uh, projects across the continent. So um, it is a journey that we must be ready to pay the price. Uh, in the long term, we will see the reward in terms of the development and the contribution to the economy of Africa. It will take a while, but we need to be willing and ready to pay uh, that price to walk that journey. The last thing I will say is that engagement is critical. We need to engage with the government. We need to engage with all stakeholders. We need to educate them. We need to have conversations every now and then uh, for us for us to succeed with funding infrastructure projects on the African continent using the public-private partnership project. Uh, I mean, uh, structure. Uh, fundamentally, for me, that capacity building process and engagement to provide an understanding of how this works to all the stakeholders, I think it is fundamental for us moving from where we are in Africa today to where we want to be. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Abraham and uh, Jensen, please. I think for me, as a parting shot, uh, uh, good infrastructure has the potential to create thousands of quality jobs in the African space. Uh, but then uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, if at all. Uh, we want to conceptualize and deliver good projects that will have both economic and social impact on, on the people uh, in the African continent. So again, uh, the three Cs, uh, let's ensure that we have the commitment from top uh, to the lower levels of government. Uh, let's ensure that we build capacity and let's instill confidence in the private sector that will honor and make sure that we work with the private sector uh, to deliver these good projects. I think we cannot uh, continue negotiating with some of the cards below the table. I think we can't, we have huge uh, catch up to play. Uh, we don't have infrastructure. Uh, we actually do not have some of the basic infrastructure. So the earlier the government officials understand that, I think the better because we can start moving forward and putting the right effort uh, to make sure that we're able to catch up and, and, and address this gap that we are facing in the African continent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johnson. Um, we arrive uh, at the end of this, uh, of this webinar. Uh, uh, before thanking uh, everybody, I will let uh, Pramas uh, uh, say some uh, uh, words of conclusion uh, uh, on, of this uh, of this seminar of this webinar, please. Thank you very much, Olivier, and thank you very much, um, everyone, for attending. We sincerely apologize for going twenty two minutes over. Um, Johnson, what an awesome way to conclude this. We need to remember that we need commitment from the government. Uh, we also need to ensure that there's capacity built for everybody involved in the process. And we definitely have to uh, make sure that there is confidence in the private sector. We now know that one hour is too short and we know that there was a multiplicity of questions that we were not able to answer, but we know that uh, this is the first uh, of many webinars and this will be addressed. We also think that we will apportion um, a bigger chunk of time to be able to um, have the discussions. But I think the key um, and outstanding issue that has come out today is the importance uh, of that commitment, the importance of the political will. Uh, today we came to talk about financing, but we have also somehow wiggled uh, back to the importance of the political will, because once you have that, then it's easy to have an appropriate risk um, allocation. And of course, you also have a more collaborative uh, public sector that will create an environment for private sector investment. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, and we hope to see you at um, the upcoming webinars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prima. Um, thank you very much for all the participants. Uh, thank you very much for our panelists, Marlior Modibo, uh, and Bram, and, and, and Jensen. Um, as mentioned, this webinar uh, has been recorded, so it, it will be available on uh, WAP website and WAP uh, YouTube, and the short summary will be published uh, 
quite soon. This seminar, as uh, mentioned by Prima, uh, helped to identify some key questions, and especially uh, I, I remember the, the role of, uh, of the sovereign fund and, and, and uh, uh, the pension fund in, uh, in, in Africa, and also the, the, the question of the capacity of the actors. And these are some very good uh, routes for and, 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 uh, and uh, topics to be developed by uh, the the finance form of uh, of what so thank you uh, very much uh, to everybody and uh, hope you to welcome you very soon on another uh, warp seminar thank you have a nice day thank you everyone have a good one bye bye